She never won a singles title in her career, but reached the top 10 ranking. She has adorned the cover of publications like FHM, Maxim, and the well-known Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Issue in 2004. She appeared in the music video for Escape and has been in a long-term relationship with popular singer Enrique Iglesias since 2001, living together in Florida with their three children. In February 2001, she had the privilege of a computer virus being named after her. In 2000, she played a minor role in the film Me, Myself and Irene, which had big stars like Renee Zellweger and Jim Carrey. In 1998, Namco released Anna Kornikova's Smash Court Tennis, a video game for Sony PlayStation. And you thought you knew Anna Kornikova? Did they contribute to her fading out as a tennis player but rising as a celebrity and star? Let us see. Celebrity status overshadows tennis talent. A bio like that would be a proud achievement for A-lister celebrities and people in showbiz. And that is the joy and agony of being Anna Kornikova, who set out to be a tennis player in Moscow in the 1980s. Along the way, her celebrity status has completely overshadowed her legacy as a tennis player. That there is not a single mention of any notable achievement in the list of her achievements that is related to tennis is her questionable legacy. That of a woman's worth being determined by her looks and how many products she can sell, then her encore talent. According to TheRichest.com, which evaluates the net worth of celebrities, Kornikova is estimated to be worth $50 million. Less than $4 million out of that 50 is contributed by her tennis earnings. In fact, in 2002, she was reported to be earning over $10 million annually through product endorsements alone. Compare this with the earnings of the Tennis Wise, two of the much more successful players of her generation. Though older and at the end of her illustrious career, Steffi Graf was still winning Grand Slams. Her net worth, 30 million. Of this, 22 million is in the form of prize money. Among top players, Martina Hingis is perhaps the most similar in age as well as playing era. The two were competitors and friends and also played and won doubles titles together. Hingis won five Grand Slam singles titles and was the top ranked player for 209 weeks. Career earnings, 25 million. Of this, 20 million is in the form of prize money. That is what is generally expected. The top players will have the lion's share of their fortune earned through sporting success. The same is true for men's tennis. The top players earn the most in endorsements as well, but not Anna Kornikova. She was different. What might have been but it need not have been this way. In fact, till her junior years, she seemed to be on her way to success as a tennis player. Kornikova's early years held no clue about how her career would turn out. Born in a sporting family, she inherited the love for sports as well as genes from her wrestling champion father and athlete mother. Her younger half-brother went on to become a world champion in youth golf. Her father, Sergei Kornikov, is believed to have said, We were young and we liked the clean, physical life, so Anna was in a good environment for sport from the beginning. Only when she started playing in tournaments around the age of 8 did she start attracting notice. This resulted in a management deal at the age of 10 and a move to Florida to train at the celebrated Nick Bolletieri's Tennis Academy. Known for attracting even elite tennis players of the generation for ironing out chinks in their game, over the next few years, her career blossomed as a junior, under 18 player, leading up to her being crowned the ITF World Juniors Champion and European Junior Champion. In keeping with the history of teen prodigies in women's tennis, she played her first WTA tournament in Moscow at the tender age of 14 even winning a round of the main draw. She represented Russia in the Fed Cup at the age of 14, the youngest ever to play and win in the Fed Cup. Her Grand Slam debut was at the age of 15 at the US Open in 1996, where she managed to reach the fourth round. She was named WTA Newcomer of the Year that year. In 1997, she reached the semi-final at Wimbledon in her first attempt only the second player to do so, the first being Chris Everett. In 1998, she broke into the top 20 in singles, though a WTA win continued to elude her, losing to Venus Williams in the final on one occasion and to Martina Hingis on another. She reached a total of four WTA finals. Her career best ranking of eighth was attained in 2000. Unfortunately, in another similarity to several female teenage prodigies before her, by 2001, her singles career had begun to slide. Just 20, she had begun to struggle with injuries by 2001, and her ranking began to slip. She played her last WTA singles game in 2003. In the meantime, she had also started playing doubles, teaming up with different players, till she formed a successful partnership with Martina Hingis, the top singles player of the era. The duo won several titles together, including two Grand Slam titles at the Australian Open in 1999 and 2002. She attained the number one WTA ranking in doubles play, taking the scenic route. By then, her career as a celebrity had begun to take off. Only the Ball Should Bounce, the campaign headline for the shock-absorbing sports bras made by Burley, 
with Kournikova as its face, is still remembered by people who follow tennis during that period. Lycos identified her as the most searched for athlete on the internet in 2001, beating super sports persons like Michael Jordan. She was called the hottest female athlete by ESPN.com in 2002. In FHM's 100 Sexiest Women in the World, she came first in the UK and US editions. You already know about the cocktail, a computer virus, and a video game named after her. Her adorning the cover of several popular publications, usually in bikinis and swimsuits, and featuring in movies and music videos. But it was not a one-way street to superstardom. The barbs on her non-achievements have been equally sharp. In the popular ESPN series, Who is Number One? that identified the most overrated athlete of the period, she was ranked as numero uno. In other words, she was the most overrated athlete in that period. ESPN also included her in its list of the biggest sporting flops of the past quarter century. The usage of the term Anna Kornikova for unsuited hole cards ace king in Texas Hold'em poker has been catching on. The term is attributed to poker commentator Vince Van Patten, who used it and added, it looks great, but never wins during a tournament. She is also at the receiving end from many players. Natalie Torziat, a one-time top 10 player who has been critical of her other tension-grabbing players. In her book called The Underside of Women's Tennis, she writes of Kornikova, I like her, but who does she think she is when she paraded around like a queen at the French Open? Austrian player Sylvia Plitschke is reported to have received congratulatory calls from many fellow players when she defeated Kornikova in the French Open. Is it Anna's fault? The question all of us need to answer is, can a person be blamed for being good looking? And a related question, can a person be blamed by putting his or her good looks to use by earning money in a perfectly legal way? What is she supposed to do? Give the money away? Say, no, I don't want it, please don't pay me? Martina Navratilova, one of the greatest ever, is reported to have put that matter into perspective and quipped in the face of criticism of Kornikova. During her years as a player and early as a celebrity, Anna's mother, Alla, called a socialite wannabe by Lambier, has been a significant influence, not unlike many other female teen celebrities. In fact, she was often compared to Terry Shields, the mother of Brooke Shields, once the archetypal stage mother from hell. Whether the influence was for Anna's good, for skillfully managing her career and introducing the lucrative endorsements, or to Anna's detriment, considering how much more she might have achieved in tennis, will need to be judged by posterity. But her greed and control was always evident. She is reported to have taken up to 50% of the money received by Anna through endorsements. She even sacked Pavel Slozil, a former tennis player who had gained fame as Steffi Graf's coach and bizarrely took upon herself the coaching responsibilities. Her interference was not limited to Anna's tennis. Pavel Bure, the Florida Panthers hockey player, who apparently proposed to Anna in a posh restaurant with an expensive ring and champagne, got cold feet when he discovered that a private celebration had been turned into a media circus to get her name splashed across the papers. The suspect? You guessed it, Ala Kornikova. It seems that Pavel Bure used the wise Russian adage, before selecting a wife, select a mother-in-law, to his advantage. Anna's dalliances with Mark Filipousis, the Australian tennis player, and Sergei Fedorov, Russian hockey star, have also been reported. But with her mother's known penchant for releasing details of her personal life, whether true or not, to get media coverage and increase her advertising price, it is difficult to judge how accurate they are. Sordid details of Alice's life emerged when, in 2010, she was charged with leaving her five-year-old son unattended for over an hour. She apparently separated from Anna's father many years back and had the child with a Baron Michael Moog Dimitri best described as a shadowy, borderline fraudulent minor European royalty trying to make it big somehow in America. Stability and giving back. Anna's struggles with fitness and form coincided with her meeting Enrique Iglesias, one of the best known and best selling Latin music artists, and the son of Julio Iglesias, one of the most successful continental European singers in the world, when she appeared in the video of his song Escape. Though they have had their share of breakups and spats, the two have been together for 21 years now and have three children together. It has perhaps helped that their views on subjects like marriage and privacy are similar. I've never really thought marriage would make a difference, he says. Marriage isn't important to me. I'm in a happy relationship. That's all that matters, she says. Both have consistently refused to deny or confirm the status of their relationship and been fiercely protective of the privacy of their family life. To her credit, though not professionally active, Anna has used her celebrity status to good effect regularly playing exhibition matches for charity. In 2004, she played in charity events organized by Elton John, Andy Roddick, and Serena Williams. She participated in a 2005 event with McEnroe, Roddick, and Chris Everett to raise money for the Indian Ocean tsunami victims. The same year, she joined hands with Hingis and played against Samantha Stoza and Lisa Raymond for charity. In 2008, she helped raise money for the Children's Hospital, Los Angeles, through her participation in the Nordica Malibu Triathlon at Malibu Beach. 
The same year, she helped raise $400,000 for the Elton John AIDS Foundation through a charity tennis match. The Legacy So, what is the problem? The unfortunate fallout is that her fame and financial success appear to have reinforced the stereotype of objectification of women and her worth being determined more by her looks than talent. One did not have to be the best tennis player to become famous or rich. One could just be good enough in tennis, but great looking. Maria Sharapova, though much more successful as a player than Anna with five Grand Slam singles titles, could be held up as another product of that school. She had a riveting rivalry with Serena Williams. Though Serena is a much more successful player, the final word in the rivalry often used by Sharapova fans is that she, Sharapova, has won more money. Martina Hingis, talking to R Sport, articulates the Kornikova effect cleverly. Anna was one of a kind, unique. She was one of the first who was just not a tennis player, but as a tennis player and a model. Her photos have appeared in fashion magazines. She opened her example to a whole generation of Russian tennis players. For the rest of the Russians, it was great that Anna gave them that opportunity because they wanted to be like Kornikova. Let's face it, reaching a top 10 ranking in world tennis is not a cakewalk. It takes years of hard work, sacrifice, and talent to reach there. Anna did. Most struggling or upcoming players today would, if offered, trade a certain top 10 spot for an uncertain Grand Slam win. It is a pretty big deal.